Welcome back to the Tour Breakaway after a long, long summer hiatus. Just took a couple weeks to enjoy, enjoy it to myself. I hope everyone else is doing the same, but I recognize that that comes with a little less cycling banter. But we're back. Got a lot of Vuelta action going on. We had some exciting Olympic Games and other races going on as well. Today concluded the first week, so to speak, of the Vuelta heading into the rest day tomorrow. And we're back to break it down. So I'll set the scene real quick. What do we see so far? What happened today? Pretty consequential stage. And then where are we going from here? Because it has been messy out there. And while we see people like Primo Roglic at the top where we'd expect, there's been a whole lot of heartbreak and headache for the rest of them. So Rog, in terms of setting the stage, just showing that he's back with vengeance on the heels of his Olympic gold medal in the time trial, setting the tone with a prologue win to open up the Vuelta and just kind of say, hey, I'm here to win for a third time. But others have made this race really animated. And since that point in stage one, we saw Jasper Philipson win two stages, including the second stage of the Vuelta. Now, with that win, Jasper Philipson made it such that Alpes and Phoenix is the first team to win a stage in all three Grand Tours this year. Not bad for a first-year World Tour team. Um, and really impressive because Yumbo themselves uh, hadn't won a stage in the Giro. So Alpes and Phoenix, the first team this year to win in all, th all three Grand Tours. Not achieved by anybody else until maybe today, but we're not going to do any spoilers until we go through the stage for anyone who hadn't seen it. Now, other highlights for me, Magnus Court winning stage six, well-deserved. And as far as I was concerned, a little overdue for a guy who's been having a great year. Uh, and that was in an incredible finale holding that five second advantage for the last one and a half kilometers after being in the break all day. Super impressive. But like I said, while we're seeing some folks like Roglic having an awesome start to the Vuelta, uh, there's been hardship and heartbreak for many others, most notably Alejandro Valverde, nasty crash out on that descent, uh, cracked his collarbone off the side of the road that required surgery. Hate to see it. Really unfortunate for uh, a guy who, has, as we know, is old, ageless, but nevertheless old. Um, but if anybody's proved that they can make a comeback against all odds, it's Alejandro Valverde himself. We can all remember back to the prologue in Dusseldorf in the 2017 Tour de France where he took a turn hot in the rainy, wet conditions, slid into a metal fence, cracked his kneecap, and then came back the following year to win the world championship. So Bala, get, get better, bud. Uh, also saw Hugh Carthy abandon and a lot of high-profile riders not living up to – expectation but i'll come to that following a short recap of what happened in stage nine because stage nine itself was quite influential in the current standing so we'll just pick up with like nine kilometers to go and we had damiano caruso way out front for the bahrain victoria squad already long solo uh going for the mountaintop win and the reason he did that is because Mikel landa apparently gave them the go-ahead saying he wasn't totally sure how his body was feeling We've got a lot of talent on this team. You guys go take your chances. So Caruso with an advantage. When I say these distance splits, you got to keep in mind these are from where Caruso was, and he held really two-and-a-half-minute advantage uh, into the final kilometer, essentially. So uh, the distances, you probably have to add a kilometer to this. But So I guess it's with 9K to go for Caruso. Uh, behind him, two-and-a-half minutes, Adam Yates' attack start, started to open things up and creating – smaller selections from the GC group. When Yates attacked, we saw Superman Lopez and Sepp Cusco. And we saw Primoz Roglic try to remain a little bit more measured. This is a long climb, pretty steady tempo climb, uh, but didn't want to start responding to all the attacks when you had a team like Ineos with it, two riders, because you still had Egan Bernal there. Uh, and you had Richie Carapaz as well. So you're not sure if, you, if you're just going to respond to every attack, uh, you, you might set yourself into the red zone uh, and, and be exposed. So uh, Rogla did not go with that move, but eventually he got restless and he decided, you know what, screw it. I can bridge across this. I am that strong um, and brought the two groups back together. Now, after the Yates attack, Richie Carapaz attacked, um, although he quickly and promptly dropped himself from there. Richie Carapaz not looking nearly as strong as he did uh, back in the, in, in the Tour de France this year. And then Yates goes again. And look, this guy, he's proven when the weather is hot, he's good. 
And we saw this in the Giro. When the weather was no good, he was no good. The one that the weather was hot, Yates was on fire. And you know, also a guy really strong in the UAE tour. And he's just attacking, attacking. And this time he goes and he was pulled by the motorbike. He actually passed the motorbike. So look, if I'm anybody else, I'm like, this is this is bullshit. Um, and Kus, he was solid today, but he wasn't able to mark all the moves. But Superman Lopez said, don't worry, Rogla, I'll take you back to Yates. And Kuz was slowly able to, to follow eventually. Um, and then it wasn't until now this point, you got about 4K to go, that this race really started to blow apart. So um, marking that move and eventually pulling back Yates there, Enric Moss went to the front now at just about that 4K mark. And Rogla and Yates were able to go with them, but Yates at this point, too many attacks in the legs. He was done and he dropped off the back. So you got you got Moss and Roglic going for it side by side. Moss doing all the pulling. And you kind of had to wonder, okay, is Roglic gonna think, okay, let's work one, two and just extend this gap on everybody else, recognizing it's better to put a lot of time into everybody except you than to, you know, make you work and try to put 15 seconds in at the end. Um, but Moss had to pull a full kilometer before saying, dude, I know you got it in your legs. You can't give me a stone cold. I'm tired face. Like Carapaz does. We know how good you are. And Roglic said, okay, fine. I'll take my turns. And so they did a little bit of rotating. It wasn't the best partnership I've ever seen, uh, but they did start to work together and that helped extend a little bit. They had for a while hovered around 15 seconds over that chase group. Uh, but they were finally able to make a little bit of a difference. And behind, you had Yates pulling Bernal and Jack Haig, along with Superman Lopez. And you just see that Bernal slowly cracking, cracking into pieces. And when Yates did one acceleration with that group, Bernal just fell right out the back. And we had this awkward moment where it's like, okay, well, what do you do if you're in EOS? Do you, do you just say, Yates, you, you just got to crack on and and try to get time and protect your position on GC or do you, or do we stay here and try to garner every second for Bernal figuring that he's our GC guy at the end of the day. So a little bit strange, but uh, Haig then attacked and that was curtains for Bernal because Yates at that point did need to go and he couldn't, he couldn't wait at that point. He had to follow the move by Jack Haig and Superman was there as well. So, Caruso, he made it to the finish, plenty of time to take it in. His second Grand Tour stage win, also his second Grand Tour stage win of this season. An incredible set of opportunities and capitalization of them by Damiana Caruso. Love to see it. Mass and Roglic, they come up behind. They're about, they had about 600 meters to go when Caruso crossed the line. Uh, Moss still pulling on the front, so we fully expected Roglic to take the sprint, which he did easily, even getting a one-second gap. Uh, and they rolled in a minute and five back from Caruso. Now the clock effectively starts at that point because Caruso still so far back in GC, uh, not a podium threat, or at least, at least today. So the Hague Yates Lopez groups group come, came in about 40 seconds back. And then Bernal rolls in with Gino Mater and Giulio Ciccone, who both caught up to him another 25 seconds back of that. So we saw Bernal hemorrhage over a minute to Roglic today. Uh, definitely not a good day for Bernal. Uh, great day for Bahrain Sands Landa, who rolled in five minutes later with uh, Mark Padoon pulling him in. But good efforts by, obviously, Caruso for the win and also Gino Mater. So good stuff there. Overall, look, the big losers of the GC in the tour so far, just going back to the, the earlier point that I paused on, Richie Carapaz, Mikel Landa, particularly after today, and Roman Bardet, all out of hope for any sort of GC uh, aspiration. Now, overall, where do we stand? So we're at rest day one now, and here's what we got. We got Primoz Roglic in the lead, and the only man in striking distance is Enric Moss. Now, if you look back, and I just spent a moment on this because this is actually a really pivotal moment for Enric Moss and a big moment in his career. A couple years ago, Enric Moss was all the rage. As a young guy, he finished second. He's only 26 now. So as a young guy back in 2018, you know, in his early 20s, at the age of 22, 
he was second in the Vuelta a España. Now, at the time, he was riding for Decoyne Quick Step, and everyone thought he's going to be the next great big thing. Now, we moved ahead to 2019, and he was meant to be a leader for Decoyne Quick Step in the Tour de France. Now, recall, this is the, the hero year, the hero race of Julian Alaphilippe, who wore the yellow jersey for, I believe it was 13 stages. And Moss really wasn't able to support him. He was not able to deliver. And all these question marks came up around Enric Moss. What would he be? Who would he be? And for a lot of people, they were happy that he would no longer be on Decoin a Quick Step, thinking, hey, that whole Vuelta thing was a fluke. Now, came back strong last year, finished fifth in both the Tour de France and the Vuelta España. His fifth place in the Tour de France, quite impressive because he did it really with an epic time trial on the Planche de Belfi. This year, Tour de France, sixth. And in a Tour de France where we saw a number of the main favorites fall off due to crashes, Roglic crashed out, um, we expected more from Moss. Now, Moss has a better shot than ever to equal his best career finish in a Grand Tour with second. And sitting here, looking at the people who are, who are poised for the podium, the reality is Primoz Roglic is going to have this whole thing locked up unless he falls off his bike. But the way he's climbing, the way they look today, these two guys were the best cli- – well, aside from Caruso, Roglic and Moss were by far the best two climbers on the day. They're, they're by far the strongest. But even still, it's relatively easy for Primoz Roglic to dispose of Enric Moss uh, when it matters most. And also with both a time advantage now and – a notable advantage for the pending time trial still to come later in the race. Roglic can afford to ride defensively should Moss be uh, on an exceptional day. And he's got the support squad with him with Kreuzvik and, and Sepkus to support him. So, so long as Primo's Roglic stays on his bike, this is his Vuelta a España to lose. And we fully, I fully expect that he locks in his third consecutive Vuelta a España victory. Now, in Moss's case, you look at the guys behind him, Miguel Angel Lopez, who is 54 four seconds behind him, 53 seconds behind him, Jack Haig, who's another 21 seconds back on Superman Lopez, and Egan Bernal at 152, Adam Yates at 207. So he's got a minute and a half advantage over, over the Bernal and Yates crew. With how Enric Moss is riding right now, it's relatively safe to say that he is not going to hemorrhage meaningful time to Bernal or Yates, who I think are his biggest threats. While Miguel Angel Lopez might be able to perform well on a high mountain finish uh, somewhere in this race, he's not going to have the leash to go on any big escape attacks where he could get a lot of time, and he's certainly not going to gain any advantage in the time trial. So advantage there. Jack Haig, solid. And now he's got opportunities to, to ride for himself now that Mikel Landa has put himself out of contention, but he's never done it before, and he's never um, you know, proven himself over a full Grand Tour that he can do it. So Enric Moss is slotted very nicely for second place here, and I'd go so far as to say that these two places are firmed up. Roglic and Moss should not lose these positions, and so this is going to be a career moment for Moss to equal – uh, his Grand Tour podium second place here at the Vuelta and be a real, probably bigger than a silver lining for the team uh, who are reeling after losing after losing Bala. Now, it's going to be really interesting thereafter because Miguel Angel Lopez can't time trial to save his life. He's been relatively inconsistent this year. And then you've got Jack Haig, Egan Bernal, Adam Yates, all in immediate striking distance. 40 seconds at this stage separating all those folks is nothing. That is all to play for. Now behind him, in seventh, Giulio Ciccone, who's a little bit further back. He's 239 back on Roglic um, and 40 seconds back uh, from from uh, Yates and Bernal. He's got a little bit of work to do, but certainly has a shot, outside shot at, at finishing up in the top five. Um, only other ones to look out for, but also super disappointing – is down a little bit further. Alexander Vlasov certainly expected a much better performance out of him. I was expecting him to be on the podium here. Um, At 3.55 back, does he have a shot? I guess. 
but all signs point to him uh, really being out of this race based on uh, the inconsistency of his form to date. So history awaits Primoz Roglic for three straight and a career opportunity for Enric Mas to finish second here and then all to play for for the rest of the spots. But it's been a it's been a, a lit up uh, crash marred Vuelta. It's one where the heat has been extreme and really showcasing how that impacts riders. Weather is absolutely going to be a factor here in the last two weeks of the race and it's going to it's going to shape guys' outcomes because what we've seen is one bad day you know one day where you get a little overheated a little undernourished it just amplifies the effects of that and so um we'll see how folks come out of the rest day what their legs are like and if we're going to have anybody uh who, who shows some nasty um cracks already as the second week starts but it won't be too too bad of a day as they get going it largely flat stage for stage 10 there is uh near the finish a category two climb uh puerto de amashar 10 kilometers at five percent very reasonable uh, we might even see some of the punchier guys get over it a magnus court again a michael matthews probably get over that depending on the structure of the race and how things unfold um but thereafter uh we're gonna see some we're gonna see who's got legs uh and who's gonna be able to make it over some of the the real heavy mountain passes that'll come um as we get deeper into into week two um but they've got a couple stages to get there so good to be back great to break it down and um love to know what you think Who's going to pull this whole thing off? Is this in the bag for Roglic? Is Moss got second locked up? And who's going to take that final step of the podium? Love to know. So till next time, thanks for listening. The Tour Breakaway.